you are the chosen ones, the ones who were able to make it through the day and not have to take an afternoon nap, although I know a couple of people have taken more than one nap already today, so <laughs> recovering from things. So I appreciate very much you being here. Um, today we're going to be talking about Moses, the Israelites, and the crossing of the Red Sea, since we are, of course, in the Red Sea right now. In fact, we have been in the Red Sea ever since we left the Suez Canal. When we went up the Gulf of Aqaba to Aqaba and visited Petra, um, when we stopped at Sharm El Sheikh, uh, all, all of those locations are still part of the Red Sea. We'll be in the Red Sea until we pass out into the Gulf of Aden. So, um, so we're going to be talking. Many, many people, when they think about the Red Sea, that one of the first things, if you, you know, if you went to vacation Bible school or Sunday school or you know, got any stories from your parents about Moses when you were a little kid. The crossing of the Red Sea is one of the great events in the, the story of the world's three great monotheistic religions. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today, but before I get into that, let me say this is the list of talks that I will be doing from this point on. Tomorrow um, I will be doing in the morning the Children of Abraham, which is a look at the fact that, again, all three of the great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all see their um, originator as being Abraham. And we're going to talk about how that is and how they sort of split apart at various points so that they became three separate religions, even though they, have them, they see themselves as having the same founder. And then, um, special treat for you, the following day, I'm going to be doing a talk in the morning. Uh, I, I should tell you, tomorrow afternoon, Emily will be doing a talk on the tomb of Tutankhamun, so you'll have a chance, and all of this will be published. You'll be hearing about exact times. In fact, Emily and I aren't completely sure on what times. We'll, we'll find out when you do. Um, we're just here. We'll do whatever they want us to do. So I will be doing a talk the following day on Lawrence of Arabia, the Bedouins, and victory in the First World War. And, you know, you, you ladies will find that interesting too, I think. So it's not just a man thing that I'm going to be talking about the war. Um, fascinating stories, and then in the afternoon, the special treat is we will be showing the movie, Lawrence of Arabia, 1961 movie. Um, Peter O'Toole is introduced to the world, um, and so it should be great fun. Now, this, is, this was a movie back when they didn't make such long movies, but this movie is like three hours and 40 minutes. It's so long that built into it, there's an intermission you know, with music, so you can go get popcorn and stuff. So we'll show that movie um, in the afternoon after I've done the talk on Lawrence of Arabia, and then the following day, um, we'll start out in the morning with Emily doing a talk on studying Egyptian mummies, and I will do in the afternoon Introduction to Islam, uh, talking about the, the Islamic faith, the history of it, the principles of faith behind it, um, my experience has been that very few Americans or Canadians, very few Westerners, unless you live in a large city where there's an Islamic community, very few of us know very much about it. So we'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll do the following day in the morning, I will do the uh, history, culture, and conflict of the Middle East. And then in the afternoon, Emily will do ancient Arabia. So we've got a lot of talks still coming up. Um, Emily's going to talk about architecture in Arabia, a recent history of Oman. So lots, you know, stay tuned. We've got lots of things coming up. But today we're talking about Moses, the Israelites, and the crossing of the Red Sea. Now, as I mentioned, all three of the great monotheistic religions see the Exodus event, as we call it. Exodus is the Greek word, which means to exit, to leave. If you go to any country where they speak Greek and you're in a facility that has an exit sign, it will say Exodus, this way. So the Exodus event um, is one of the most important events in Judaism for sure, in Christianity and in Islam. One of our tour guides uh, yesterday, she and I started talking about this, and the question of did it really happen? In fact, one of the, I want, the way I want to approach this today is to talk first about uh, why is it important? Did it really happen? When did it happen? Because there are very different ideas about that, even among the people who believe it really was a historical event. And then where did it happen? Which there has been a lot of new thinking about that just in recent years. So we're going to talk about that. I will start out telling you there is no archaeological evidence that confirms the Exodus or even the presence of the Israelites in Egypt. Is that fair, Emily? Am I are we good there? Um, so the there's there is a reference I'll mention in a moment, uh, in, in a few moments about the Israelites in 
that was found in one of the mortuary um, chapels, but we're going to get into some of the details about what people believe about that. Um, so, why is this important? The Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, is full of references. Not only does it have the story in the book of Exodus, you know, there's a whole book about this event, and then the immediate following to it. Not only is there the Exodus reference, but throughout all of the Hebrew Bible and the Christian New Testament are references to the importance of this. For instance, in the book of Deuteronomy, we read, uh, God says, again, through Moses is the tradition, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This theme that the Exodus was, it, it, it's considered the charter event, to use the technical term for it, meaning it is the point at which the Hebrew people became a real people in a particular way. The Exodus was the place where, and from then on, throughout all of the Hebrew Bible, when God is talking about the Hebrew people, he says, remember, I am the Lord your God because I'm the one who brought you up out of captivity in Egypt. Um, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that, that uh, event was critical to the understanding the Jewish people had from that moment on of what it meant to be uh, a Jew, what it meant to be part of the Hebrew people, an Israelite. And again, there are many other places. The book of Judges uh, says, When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. So this charter event, this sort of launching event for the Israelites, all three religions. When I spoke to the guy yesterday, um, uh, one, of our, one of our guys who is Muslim, one of our guys was Presbyterian. He and I sort of patted each other on the shoulder every time we saw each other. But one of the guys is Muslim, and she said, well, of course, I believe it really happened because it's recorded in the book of, Quran, of the Quran, which we'll talk about later. So it's in the Hebrew Bible, which is accepted by Christians, and it is in the Quran. Um, it is the source of the most important of all of the Jewish festivals, which is the Pesach, which we, uh, we know of as the Passover. The Passover event happened immediately prior to the Israelites coming up out of Egypt, which was um, the, immediately prior to them crossing the Red Sea. It is accounted daily in the Jewish prayers. Uh, and this has become, the, the Exodus event has become a symbol in many, many different circumstances of persecution and oppression for many different groups of people down through history. In the, uh, the American slaves prior to the Civil War, they sang songs about Moses bringing his people up of, out of captivity because this was a theme that they celebrated. The Civil Rights Movement identified this theme of Moses, you know, go down Moses, go down to Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go, right? So this theme has, has echoed even amongst people who didn't have any particular religious association because of this theme of freedom. Now, this goes back, as does everything else, to Abraham. Uh, Abraham, the father of the Hebrew people, I can according to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now, in addition to Abraham, this icon shows Abraham on the left. You can tell by the length of the beard, he's the oldest one. Abraham, Abraham's son Isaac, and Isaac's son Jacob. This is the Jewish and Christian version. Now, this is the family tree of Abraham and his descendants, actually starting with his father Terah. You'll see Abram up there. Abraham's original name uh, was Abram. Abram means exalted father. Abraham was the name he was given later, which means father of many, because God promised him, even as an old man, you will be the father of many peoples. His son was Isaac. Now you'll notice just to the right of that, there's Ishmael. Ishmael is much more important in Islam because the, the Islamic peoples believe that Ishmael was the son through whom the real promise was given, that it was Ishmael that was almost sacrificed on Mount uh, Moriah. But the Jewish and Christian view is that it was Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob is the one who later was renamed Israel. That's where the nation gets its name. And Esau was the father of the Edomites. Ishmael, the other son of Abraham, was the father of the Arabic peoples. And then Jacob had 12 sons. 
those 12 sons were the parents of the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of them, actually one of the younger ones, was Joseph. Joseph is the key player leading up to the whole story of the Exodus because uh, if we say that civilization began around 3200 BC, now you can use different dates for that. It depends on what you, how you want to count civilization starting. I have actually used the date 4500 before, but it's when civilization happened, when there was writing and cultivation and, and uh, domestic animals and all of that. About 2091, Abram is called by God. Now, you'll notice the C's there. C means circa or about. It means best we know. You know, that's the, these are traditional dates. You'll notice I put traditional at the top of this. Then about 2066, Abraham's son Isaac is born. About 20, 2006, Isaac's son Jacob, who became named Israel, is born. And then 1898, one of Jacob's sons, Joseph, is sold into slavery. You remember the story about Joseph and his, his, his wonderful coat that his father gave him? He was kind of a spoiled brat. His father gave him everything, and his brothers got jealous, and they got tired of listening to him talk about how great he was, and so they literally sold him into slavery to a bunch of Midianite nomads who were going through in a caravan, and they took him off into Egypt. Well, when, Egypt, uh, when Joseph got to Egypt, it turned out that God was blessing him, and he was able to interpret dreams, and this came to the attention of Pharaoh, and he was so pleased with Joseph that he ended up eventually, Joseph becoming sort of the, the chief operating officer for all of Egypt. He was in charge of everything because Joseph um, interpreted a dream that Pharaoh had about seven sickly cows and seven healthy cows. And, and Joseph said there will be seven years of, of, of healthy crops and things will be great, but then there will be seven years of famine. Well, Joseph was put in charge of saving up all the grain that he could to take care of the country. And so when they got to the years of famine, Egypt was the only, th only country in this part of the world that had enough food. Every place else was suffering from a terrible famine. And one of the things that happened, 1874, we have Jacob and his family settling in Egypt. Jacob sends his other sons down. He thinks that Joseph is dead, as they told him he was dead. They go down to Egypt to try to buy grain because of the famine. Lo and behold, after some shenanigans, they find out that one of their brothers, one of Jacob's sons, is actually in charge of everything under the Pharaoh in Egypt. And so they end up settling there. So you've got the Israelites in Egypt living there. And initially they were living there under favor because Pharaoh had made had loved Joseph and respected him and he was kind of in charge of everything. So you end up with this idea of Joseph, one of the sons of Israel or Jacob, being in charge of all of the nation of Egypt. And this is a scene, an artistic scene, of his brothers coming down there, and then he revealed himself to his brothers and said, I am your brother Joseph. A wonderful, a wonderful passage there. His brothers, of course, are scared to death because they think this guy's in charge of the whole nation of Egypt under the Pharaoh, and he's going to really, he's going to stick it to us because we sold him into slavery. But Joseph was a righteous man, and he said, you know, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. And so he was able to save his people because of that. All right. Later on, we come to a time after Joseph's death, quite a long time after Joseph's death, when a new Pharaoh comes along who did not know about Joseph. And he ends up putting the Israelites, who had been under favor and protection, putting them into uh, servitude as slaves. It was very interesting that our guy in Egypt, you know, there's always political correctness no matter where you go. She said that the, the Israelites left Egypt because of taxation. Well, that's not the Jewish and Christian version of it. They left because they had been enslaved, all right? So, at some point, the Pharaoh, a Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph, and so the Israelites were put into slavery. And I'm going to talk about which Pharaohs I think this was. I had a great conversation with one of the guys about this. Then, while they're enslaved, there is a great story about the fact that the Israelites were, they were supposed to kill all of the sons that were born in order to keep the Israelites from continuing to multiply, because there were getting to be too many of them. Um, there are two women, and I love this fact, two women, they were midwives, named Shifra and Pua. The fact that we have, 3,500 years later, we know what their names were, Shifra and Pua. And the, the Pharaoh said, whenever there's a, if you midwives are there, and if a boy is born, you are to kill the boy. Let the girls live, but the boys you kill. Well, they wouldn't do it. 
And the Pharaoh later on calls them back in and says, why aren't you killing the boys like I told you to? And they said, well, you know, Hebrew women are much sturdier than you, you Egyptian women. They have the babies before we even get there, while we're on the way. And so we haven't been able to do anything about it. And those two women were honored you know, by God. And then down through history, we have remembered their names. The Pharaoh tells them, any, any, the, all of the Israelites, any sons you have, you have to kill them. Well, a baby is born whom we know as Moses. And Moses, his mother did not want to kill him, understandably. So she hides him in a basket that she coats with pitch so it's waterproof. And she puts him in the edge of the Nile River. Pharaoh's daughter, this is the biblical story now, you know, the background for what we're talking about. Pharaoh's daughter finds him, and he's a beautiful little boy, and so she decides she's going to raise him. And Moses' older sister, seven years older, Miriam, is standing by when, she, when Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses and says, you know, I know a Hebrew woman who can nurse this baby for you, because it just so happens she just had a baby. And so Moses' own mother, Yachabed, ends up being his nursemaid, and he grows up in the household of the Pharaoh. This is the biblical story. So here we have, these, these stories are so important, there are libraries full of art representing this. The finding of Moses by Pharaoh's daughter, and then Moses growing up in the household of the Pharaoh. Because of the fact that the Israelites were enslaved, Moses grows up, he, he, find, he knows he's a Hebrew, but he's in the house of the Pharaoh. At one point he is out amongst the Hebrew slaves and he finds a, an Egyptian supervisor beating a Hebrew man. And he kills the slave uh, supervisor and buries his body. And he thinks he's gotten away, from, uh, away with it, but the next day he stops two Hebrews from fighting and one of them turns to him and says, are you gonna kill me like you did that Egyptian? And he realizes they know what he's done and so he runs for it. He leaves and goes off to the land of Midian, which is traditionally understood to be in Arabia. So here we have a photograph of Moses <laughs> killing the Egyptian supervisor, you know, the slave driver. Um, the photographs from back then are really poor, so we have drawings instead. <laughs> so Moses goes off into Midian. He meets a woman, marries her, and then ends up working for her father, so his father-in-law named Jethro. You remember at St. Catherine's Monastery, uh, Moses as well. When we went in, just before you went back into the chapel, Moses as well. Traditionally, that's where he met his wife and ended up working for his father-in-law, Jethro, for 40 years. Um, then, after working for 40 years, he is out tending flocks for Jethro, and he sees a burning bush, which you also saw, the traditional burning bush, right? It was burning and not being consumed, and so he walks toward it to find out what's going on, and the voice of God says to him, take off your shoes because this is holy ground. And, he, and God tells Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt. I have heard the cry of my people in Egypt as slaves. I want you to go back and free them from their oppression. Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. That's where that expression comes from. And so, while he's reluctant at first, and he really argues with God, and he comes up with all sorts of excuses, Moses finally agrees that he will do what God has told him to do and go back. This is the account. I have to give you the biblical accounts. Carolyn asked me if I was going to read the whole book of Exodus. I'm not, but I'll give you a few verses because it's important. The event of the burning bush in Exodus 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb is the other name for Mount Sinai, which you saw when you were at St. Catharines, the traditional location. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord said that he, that when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. We then have, immediately following this, the call of Moses, where God says to him, I want you to go down and free the Israelites. Tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. I won't read all of this, so we don't take too much time. 
Also at this point, a very important thing happens, and that is Moses, as one of his excuses, one of the reasons why he doesn't think he should have to do this, we, we have Moses saying to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What is this God's name? Because they believed in many gods back then. Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I will be remembered from generation to generation. This Hebrew expression, I am, is Yahweh, is the best way we know how to pronounce it. Um, you may have seen Y-H-W-H. Um, it's called the Tetragrammaton, the proper name of God. And the Jews, of course, we're not allowed to say this name for fear that they might break the commandment to not take the name of God in vain. And so whenever they came to that, they would use the expression Adonai, which means Lord. Um, when we talk about children of Abraham, I'll give you an interesting little factoid about that. So God has called Moses, has said, go back to Israel, tell the Pharaoh and let my people go. This is my name. And so Moses goes back. He presents himself to Pharaoh, and I've always had a question is, why would the Pharaoh, who at this point was the most powerful person in the world, there was nobody really to challenge the, the, uh, the power of Egypt, why would he let this nomad Jew, a representative of a slave people, just come in and talk to him several times? Well, it may be because they were sort of related. I'll get back to that. So he comes in, he presents himself and says, God says you should let the Israelites go, and Pharaoh says, you know, like, right, why should I? Moses, using his staff, does several extraordinary things. And in each case, the magicians of the Pharaoh are able to reproduce it. He drops his staff and it turns into a snake and all this sort of thing. But at a certain point, Moses is able to do things the magicians can't. Um, that keeps happening. So again, we have a lot of different representations. One of the things that we discovered along the way is that Moses does look exactly like Charlton Heston. <laughs> you all know that, right? <laughs> Later on, he will become the one through whom God gives the law as well. But Moses keeps asking Pharaoh to let the people go, that God has ordered that the Israelites should be allowed to leave. Pharaoh keeps saying no. Finally, by God's instructions, Moses tells Pharaoh, if you don't let them go, the consequences are going to be dire. It's going to be severe. And we end up with the ten plagues against Egypt. First, the Nile turns to blood. Then, second, and each time, the Pharaoh, he'll sort of say, well, well, maybe I should let you. No, I'm not going to do it. Then there is a plague of frogs, a plague of lice and gnats, a plague of flies, there is a plague of disease on the cattle, a plague of boils or sores on people and animals, a plague of hail that destroys both crops and cattle, a plague of locusts, a plague of darkness, and finally, the ultimate plague is the plague of the death of the firstborn of all living things in Egypt, both people and animals. And when that happens, when the plague of the death of the firstborn happens, finally, Pharaoh says, enough, go, take your people and leave. And we have the exodus of the people from Egypt, that is Moses and the Israelites. The traditional date, and I want to be clear you understand, I'm going to talk about this in just a second. The traditional date is circa 1446 BC. Now, a fascinating thing, I'm going to back up one, all of these different things. Have you ever heard of the Lake, Lake Nyos in Cameroon? There have been several instances, Lake Nios in 1986 is, and I'm not saying this is the case, but it's fascinating. Lake Nios is a lake in Cameroon that they had a massive eruption of uh, carbon dioxide from beneath the lake. What happened was the first thing is it pushed all the oxygen to the surface and the mineral deposits in the lake, the iron deposits turned, were oxidized almost overnight and they turned red. The water was red like blood. The animals all died that were in it, and the frogs, the ones that could get out, fled onto the land. They had a, you know, a plague of frogs. They had gnats because of all the dead fish and everything, and flies. There were boils and sores because of the gases that came out. 1,746 people died in, within a matter of a couple of hours at night while they were asleep because of the carbon dioxide that came up out of the lake, and the carbon dioxide is heavy, and it ran along the the ground, 
They died, the people died. Um, it's an extraordinary thing, and you can sort of go down the list. I'm not saying this is what happened, because the idea of a, the River Nile, which is a moving body of water, is different than a lake. There's all sorts of reasons, but it's, a, it's fascinating that we've had natural phenomena that seem to sort of parallel some of these things. So in traditional date, 1446 BC, the Israelites leave from, from Egypt. They march out, and before they go, the, the Egyptians are so glad to be rid of them at this point, they give them gold, gold earrings and nose rings and all sorts of treasures kinds of stuff. They leave, now, they're, you know, I'm, I'm a traditionalist myself, and so I believe, as did our guy who's, who's Islamic, I'm Christian, I believe in that something did happen in the Exodus, that in fact something had to happen because this is the charter event of Judaism, Christianity, and very significant Islam as well. There are a few parts of this story that I think we have to sort of say, well, I wonder. For instance, we're told in scripture that 603,550 men over age 20 left. Well, if that's just the men over age 20, then that means there probably would have been somewhere in the neighborhood of two million total people, counting women and children, plus their animals and whatever else they were taking. If they were walking 10 across, that would be a line 150 miles long. So probably not literally 600,000 people. There are several other explanations for that. It's true that in scripture, in the Bible, there are places where numbers are symbolic. For instance, there's even a, a system called uh, a gematria is where uh, letters, or numbers rather, represent letters. And the gematria for 603,550 actually comes out saying the words, um, the Nai Israel called Rosh, which means the children of Israel, every individual. So this may be a gematria, a number code that represents um, all of the Israelites came out. As they left, once they left, we have Pharaoh recognizing that he has made a terrible mistake. He has just let all of his workforce leave. And so he decides he's going to go after them. Again, I'm not going to read all of this. I want to get to some other things. But we're told that Pharaoh got on his chariot, he got his armies together, and he decided to go after them. And the Israelites recognized that they were being chased. The passage down here in verse 22, the Israelites all of a sudden have decided being freed from slavery wasn't as good as I, an idea as they thought. And they say, didn't we say to you, Moses, in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. You saw this if you went to Luxor. This is at the Temple of Luxor, to the left-hand side, you know, behind um, one of the, the statues behind the uh, obelisk that's there. This is an image of a pharaoh. This is probably Ramses the second, with a chariot and horses, and then there are others behind him. So this is what the Israelites were looking at. The army of Pharaoh, the most powerful army in the world, chariots, war horses coming after them, and they're not real keen about that. Moses says to God, what am I supposed to do about this, God? And God says, hold your hand out over the water, which Moses does, and we read, the waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, and a wall of water on their right and, a, and on their left, they go through on dry ground, and then God tells Moses, stick your hand out again, just as the, the Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's armies had entered into the water to chase them, Moses holds his hand out again, the waters close over him, over the uh, Pharaoh and his army, or at least his army, it's not real clear if Pharaoh's in there or not, probably not, I think, um, and they are all killed. And so the Israelites are now free. This again has been the, the subject of so many different pieces of art, so many different um, representations down through the, the centuries. Um, movies made about it, the images of the Israelites walking through on dry ground with a wall of water on each side. There are even very, very modern sort of representations. I like this one. <laughs> You'll notice that the, the, the truck in the back is Moses' transport, and it says, caution, Joseph's bones, because the story is that they took Joseph's bones, you know, that the, was so important to them, with them as they left Egypt to go back to Israel, because they had promised Joseph when he was alive that they would take his bones back to his homeland. And then Gary Larson even got in on the act. This is an image of Moses as a kid. You see the glass? Separating the milk in his glass. So this is, this 
event has captured the imagination of people ever since then. Now, we have to be careful when we read any ancient documents, including the Bible, as strictly history. History as we understand history, which is a logical series of events that connect to each other, did not happen until um, the 400s BC. The Greeks, Herodotus and Thucydides, were the first ones that wrote history that we would recognize as history. And so we always have to be a little cautious about trying to read this as too much literal history. There are three different approaches to understanding the Exodus. The traditional approach is that it did occur. And the, there's then an alternative approach, maybe it occurred, there is a non-traditional, more modern approach that says, no, it didn't happen. Now, the reason that the, uh, a more non-traditional approach is that it didn't happen is, as I said when I started, there is no archaeological evidence for the Israelites being in Egypt or for the Exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea having occurred. Now, we shouldn't be too shocked about that, though, because ancient rulers did not record things that did not put them in the best light. In fact, this is probably more true, and I, I told Emily I should give her a chance for a rebuttal after this, and she'll, I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, the Egyptians especially believed that when you wrote something down, it had such a power that you could bring things into existence by putting them into writing, or take them out of existence by not having them written. This is the reason why you see images, hieroglyphs chiseled away, faces of, of various leaders that were went out of favor later chiseled off, if it wasn't written, it couldn't be. It wasn't going to be real anymore. And so, it's not unusual to think the Egyptians, especially, would not have recorded things that didn't, may not have put them in the best light. Um, it's also true that the idea of there being some other kind of evidence in the desert, Lawrence of Arabia, one of the reasons that the British army asked him to join with their efforts in the in the Arabian arena, the Middle Eastern theater is because he had been a young archaeologist visit and he had done a survey of the whole Sinai Peninsula and one of the things he had said was I'm anxious to see if I can find any evidence of Moses well after spending an extended time in Sinai Peninsula he said I'm not surprised you find evidence of you know you don't find evidence of anything in the Sinai you know in the desert things just don't last very long unless they're you know sealed and buried and dry or whatever so he didn't find any evidence but he didn't think there was too much to be made of that um, so the question did it occur Traditionally, yes. Alternate, maybe. Non-traditional, no. When did it occur? Let's talk now about when it might have occurred. There are three alternatives to this. The more traditional approach is that it occurred in the 15th century BC, which is 1446. Now, I have a fairly specific date there. I still say circa. There is a more modern idea which came up in the early 20th century that if it happened, it happened later. So the 13th century BC. And again, the non-traditional view, if it didn't happen, then it didn't happen at any time. And we need to recognize that. Um, I will tell you why I believe that the first is the case, that it did happen in the 15th century BC. This is the traditional understanding of the date of occurrence. And it continued until the early 20th century, early 20th century, William Albright, who's sort of the dean of Holy Land archeology, span he developed the theory that the Hebrew records, now this is surprising, when he came along, people had sort of discounted the biblical records altogether, and William Albright actually was a traditionalist in the sense that he said, I really think that, that most of the Hebrew record is correct, but he said, I think the Exodus happened later than the traditional view because of not what is found in Egypt, but what is found in Canaan, where the Israelites went to. And so, again, early 20th century, some, some archeologists like John Garstang looking at the city of Jericho, for instance. Garstang in the early 20th century said, I believe that Jericho was destroyed when the Israelites came in. Jericho was the first city they came to when they crossed the Jordan River. And the tradition is that Joshua and his people marched around the city seven times and blew their horns and God caused, caused the walls to fall down. Well, Garstang said that it was a walled city. It did fall down. It was then burned, but it wasn't looted. There's all this evidence for that. And Garstang, in the 1930s said, I believe that this story is accurate, that this really did happen, and it did happen in the 15th century BC. Later on, Kathleen Kenyon was an archeologist who came there in the 1950s, and she said, no, I don't think it did because the, the ceramics, the pottery doesn't show up. You heard some guides tell us, pottery is the one thing that's everywhere. And so it's one of the most important things they can use to determine how old things are. 
And Kathleen Kenyon said, there is not pottery here from certain locations where they would have imported pottery. But in effect, she said she was making a decision that it wasn't destroyed in the 15th century based upon what wasn't there. And again, many of the arguments against the traditional date are arguments ex silencio, as they would say, from silence. It's the absence of evidence that causes people to believe that. Other, um, other archaeologists have said Albright was right. It was in the, the 13th century. A lot, some people have come along more recently and said, no, the traditional is right. It's the 15th century. We don't know for sure. Um, I actually, it's interesting, though. I heard one Holy Land archaeologist uh, named Jody Magnus talking about this, and she said, well, she was taking the approach that it happened in the 1250s, and she said, well, at Jericho, it could not have been destroyed by the Israelites in the 1250s because there wasn't a walled city there. It hadn't been for over 200 years. Well, if you back up from 1250, 200 years, you get the traditional date, which is the 1440s, all right? So it's a, there's a very strange kind of consideration there. But much of the evidence comes from what we find in ancient Canaan, modern Israel or Palestine, in terms of the evidence. Now, the reason why 1446 is the traditional date is from a biblical reference. And I should say there's two kinds of evidence for ancient cultures. One is the written documents. And the thing about written documents is they only talk, they don't talk about common people usually. They're almost always only about the wealthy, the, the rulers, etc. And they're very limited. And there's archaeological evidence. And archaeological evidence has the advantage of also telling you about local, you know, the ordinary people. But in 1 Kings, the sixth chapter, it says, in the four in the four hundred and eightieth year, there's a letter missing there, in the four hundred and eightieth year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign after Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. Now we know when the temple of Solomon was started. It was in 966 BC. We have evidence of that not only from other records in Israel, but from uh, from other nations around them. Well, if we go back 480 years from Solomon's temple, that puts the Exodus at 446 BC. That's why that's the traditional date. Okay. Now, a lot of people have tried to say, well, this 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 number isn't exact. Scholars have looked at it and said the way it's presented seems to be that it does. They do mean it to be exact. There are a lot of questions about that. If this is accurate and I believe it is, 1446, then that means the Pharaoh of the Exodus was Tutmos III. Um, I, I wanted to go in his tomb in the Valley of the Kings, and they didn't have it open when we were there. What's that? Yeah, it's been closed for years and years. He reigned from 1479 to 1425. He was the nephew and stepson of Hatshepsut. He was co-regent with her. He's the one that she sort of pushed aside to take over. And for he was co-regent with her for over 20 years, and then he took over as the pharaoh. So the suggestion from the traditional date is that Tutmos II, his father, was the pharaoh of the oppression, the one that put them into slavery, and that Tutmos III is the one who is responsible uh, for letting them go and then chasing after them, the one who actually was interacting. And I said earlier, how is it that that Moses would be allowed to go in and meet with the Pharaoh, the most powerful man alive at that point. Well, if he was his stepbrother from 40 years ago, he probably at least would have given him an audience. And that's the suggestion, is that they would have been, by adoption, Moses having been adopted, they would have had some relationship. Um, there are two other references I want to give you that suggest that the early date might be accurate. One is the Merneptha Steli, this was found in the mortuary chapel of Merneptha, one of the pharaohs, and you saw his name in terms of the tombs. Um, this was put in his mortuary chapel as a celebration of his victories in life. It is the only Egyptian record we have that specifically mentions Israel. Now this is from the period of 1212, some, some places say 1213, to 1202 BC. And in it, it specifically says that one of the victories that, that Pharaoh Merneptah had was that he destroyed Israel. It says, Israel's seed is destroyed, Palestine is made widow to Egypt. Well, a suggestion has been made that if um, Merneptah was responsible for destroying Israel as though Israel were a nation, that would suggest that they were established as a nation by the 1200s, which means it's likely that they didn't, they, the exodus had happened quite a bit before that. 
We also have the Amarna letters. You remember we talked about Akhenaten, the monotheist, the one who tried to bring the worship of the god Aten and to the exclusion of all other gods. He was Amenhotep IV. Amenhotep IV called himself Akhenaten, and when he was Pharaoh, various of his subjects were writing to him saying, we have these people attacking us and they're taking over our cities. People from Canaan are writing to him saying, we need your help because this people, the Hapiru, are conquering us. Send an army to help us. Now again, this is dated from the 1350s to the 1330s BC, the Amarna letters that were found in El Amarna. There are a number, there are a lot of them. Well, this is the place and the time when the, Can the Canaanite region was being conquered, traditionally, by the Israelites as they took over the Promised Land and fought, took over the cities, conquered the tribal peoples. And Hapiru sounds a lot like Hebrew, the Hebrews, or Hapirus. We don't know that for a fact. There's very different ideas about that, but there is a suggestion that this too, again, if this was in the 1300s, then the Israelites were already there and conquering the people of Canaan, which suggests that they had already gotten there prior to that, around 1400 or so. So, where did this happen? The crossing of the Red Sea. If we think that the traditional view, alternate, non-traditional, where did it happen? Usually, the traditional view has been it happened somewhere north of the, the northern part of the Suez Canal or uh, north of that in some of the lakes. This view of where did the Israelites cross the sea, you'll notice Lake Timsah, the bitter lakes up in the corner here, Lake Bartowil, and then the north part of the Gulf of Suez. We came, we came right through there because that's where the Suez Canal runs now. They connected these bodies of water that had existed. Much of the, the traditional view that they, they came through one of these freshwater lakes, they were freshwater at the time, is because the name in the Bible is Yam Suf. You've probably heard this. Yam Suf means not Red Sea, but Sea of Reeds is the, is the literal translation. Um, and so the idea was that perhaps they crossed in one of these freshwater areas. The difficulty with that is there's not enough water there to to you know, wash away an army. We also have an example again in the Hebrew Bible where Yam Suf is used to refer to the Gulf of Aqaba. It talks about Solomon having ships built at Elat on the Yam Suf. So the Gulf of Aqaba the Red, was part of the Red Sea. Yam Suf clearly was used to refer to the Red Sea. There is some view that this may have been the traditional idea of this being where the Israelites came down from the land of Goshen or the land of Ramses it was first called, a crossing over some freshwater body and coming down here to Mount Sinai, the traditional location, which is where you visited. And then from there going back up, wandering in the desert for, oh, goodness, for 40 years. They always say that the reason they wandered in the desert for 40 years is because they were being led by a man who wouldn't stop and ask for directions, right? <laughs> so they wandered here and then later came up and crossed over into the Promised Land. This is a different view of it, same thing. The idea here, they crossed perhaps the northern part of the Gulf of Suez, came down to Mount Sinai up, wander, 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 back down to Gardesh Benia, and then back up and across, the first place they came to across the Jordan River was Jericho. There are various other routes that have been suggested across here because there were trade routes. There were standard ways to get across the Sinai. You all were in the Sinai. You can imagine that you don't just wander off through the Sinai. There were standard ways of going because there were oases where you could get water. All of these focus on the traditional location of Mount Sinai being here in the southern tip of the uh, Sinai Peninsula. There has been, more recently, the idea that perhaps the crossing was of the Gulf of Aqba, not the Gulf of Suez or one of these freshwater bodies. This, for instance, is one idea that they came down and where they crossed the Red Sea was here, the narrow part of the Gulf of Aqba. This is where we landed at Aqaba, Petra's up here that they crossed the Gulf of Tehran there. The problem is that the Gulf of Aqaba is like a mile deep in places, and the Strait of Tehran is not any shallower. So even if the water were pulled back, walking down a mile and then back up a mile would have been problematic, for sure. And yet, others have suggested the Gulf of Aqaba, the idea being that they crossed here at a place called Nueva, and there's several reasons why this has been suggested. One, at Nueva, there is a beach right along the edge of the water where a group of people could gather. 
there is a land bridge underneath the water. It is not nearly as deep there. And it would be possible if the water were rolled back to cross there, where other places in the Gulf of Aqaba you couldn't. There have been various discoveries. Now, the first guy who, who identified this was kind of crazy. And so, unfortunately, a lot of people have discounted it, but other scholars have followed up on this since then and say there may be something to this. The idea that they may have come down here, it talks about being entangled in the wilderness. Well, this route is all along desert. There's no entangling. But along here, there are ravines and valleys, and being entangled makes more sense. If they crossed from the beach here at Nueva across, the claim has been made by several people now that when they go underwater, they, they, find, they have found what appears to be coral-encrusted chariot wheels and axles. The problem is they're not allowed to remove anything to examine it elsewhere. That's absolutely forbidden. Plus, this side is Saudi Arabia. They're not allowed to do investigations in Saudi Arabia. The Arabian government, the Saudi Arabian government is very restrictive on that. And, and yet, some people have claimed that there is a stone pillar that appears to have been uh, mounted by Solomon in celebration of the crossing on this Arabian side. That would suggest that Mount Sinai has to be over here somewhere. And the, the location that has been most often suggested is a mountain called Jabal al-Laws, or the Mountain of the Law. Um, there has also been an indication in the New Testament in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul says, uh, is talking about Hagar, Hagar at Mount Sinai in Arabia. This area is called Midian. In every map you want to look at, that's what was understood as Midian. And when we talk about Moses going to the burning bush, he was in Midian. That's where his father-in-law lived, that's where he lived. The suggestion is that the burning bush, which is the site of Mount Sinai, is on the Arabian side of the Gulf of Aqaba, not on the Sinai side. And so, it, it is true, we want to always be fair about this, Arabia sometimes was used in Paul's time to refer to all of the area from the Arabian Peninsula all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. So it, that could have been a general reference, we can't put too much emphasis on that. But this, it's a fascinating idea that the traditional understanding of the location of the crossing of the Red Sea may have been somewhere very different. It may have been the Gulf of Aqaba, which you sailed up on the way to Aqaba before our visit to Petra. Um, so again, I'm not selling this. I, I, don't, I don't know that this is true, but it's fascinating. There are a number of questions, like the, the name Midian, um, the, a number of other references that have not made sense previously seem to fit with this kind of suggestion. And finally, once they got to Mount Sinai, whether it was here, Jabal Laws, or whether it's down here, which would be Mount Sinai as we know it today, um, Jabal Musa, or the Mountain of Moses, Remember that, that the, the location was identified in the third century by St. Helen, the mother of Constantine. There was no previous recollect, you know, recollection that this was the location, that where St. Catherine's is today was the location of Mount Sinai, until the third century um, when, or fourth century, I'm sorry, but the fourth century when St. Helen, the mother of Constantine, went there in the 300s and said, I think this is where it happened. And that's where that tradition has come from. So um, we don't know. Once they did arrive, wherever it was, to Mount Sinai, several things happened. Moses went up on the mountain and received the law, the Ten Commandments and all the other law, legal instructions that created the religion of, that we know as Judaism. The religion was actually created through Moses, the lawgiver. And we're going to talk, when we talk about children of Abraham, we'll get into that a little bit more in terms of the differentiations there. But interesting thing from this morning, Emily was talking about uh, the god Hathor who was the cow god, and that the celebration of Hathor involved dancing and celebration and drinking and all of that. Well, do you know the story? When Moses is up on the mountain, and he's up on the mountain for a long time receiving the law of God, the Israelites down below go to Aaron, his brother, and say, make a god for us to worship. And they collect up all their golden earrings, and they melt it all down, and they make a god. you remember what the god was? A cow, a golden calf, that they dance and celebrate and worship. Remember, they just come from Egypt where the God that they would have recognized up to that point was they didn't have the Ten Commandments yet. They hadn't been told, you will have no other gods before me. They had not been told, you will not make a graven image. But they had just experienced this miraculous event, which is why Moses got so upset with them. What is wrong with you people? Have you not figured out by now that the God we serve as the one God is the right one? 
but they were dancing and drinking and celebrating in front of a cow as an idol. And it makes sense that Hathor would be the one they would recognize there. They receive the law and they go on from there to wander around for 40 years before they enter the Promised Land. So just some things to think about in terms of the crossing of the Red Sea. I believe it happened. I have a traditional view. I believe it happened in the 15th century when Thutmose III would have been the, uh, the one in charge. Um, and it became the charter event for Judaism and a critical event for Christianity and Islam. Thank you very much. Any questions about any of that? Yes. Several years ago, I traveled to Greece as uh, part of the university sponsored trip and received an uh, alternative. Okay. Physical, natural, uh, natural cause crossing the Red Sea. I'm not selling it. Okay. I understand. Uh, it was the island of Theron, uh, which exploded. Okay. It's one of the biggest explosions ever. Right, the island of Thera, which we know as Santorini, if exactly. you've been to Santorini. And if you look at the lady, it exploded in the uh, area that was mostly taken out was towards the island of Egypt. And right. also Egypt. Right. So, uh, when that happened, of course, we're all familiar with, with uh, the, the tsunamis. Number one, what happened was, as I was told, right, is that the hole was so deep that the Mediterranean actually receded. Right. One of, the, one of the phenomena that happens when you have a tidal wave or a tsunami is that first the water withdraws. It's sort of like the wave is pulling out everything and then it comes back. I, I too have heard the, the, the idea that Thera or Santorini, that the explosion there may have been responsible. For instance, when they talk about hail as one of the plagues, hail coming down as a result of the, of the uh, eruption, the idea of darkness, when the when the cloud covers you know covers the sky, I I too have heard those theories. Yes. Remember plastic flow with uh, right. the sulfuric acid which uh, or sulfuric fuels right. which killed every living thing that was too young to right. run away from it. And also the red in the uh, river of Nile is one thing that the composition of the uh, walls of that island of Paris is red. Right. Right, it, it, and there have been other, like the Lake Nios event. Uh, I mentioned the idea that Thera's explosion, the you know the horrific one of the, one of the extraordinary volcanic explosions in history, may have been responsible for. It. There have been a lot of efforts to try to come up with naturalistic explanations. Sometimes they're fast; they're always fascinating. Sometimes there seem to be real real links. Um, other places, you know, don't seem to fit. For instance, the the idea that the gas flows. Um, how did it kill just the eldest ones? You know, some people have said the reason was in Egypt that the eldest son always had the, the premier location and his bed was close to the floor and the other one slept up higher. And so only, the, you know, there's a very strict limit how far we can go with that. Yes? Right. It's a question which would help establish the feasibility of any of the particular rules. Okay. I certainly am not a meteorologist or nor historical climatologist. It is a fact that 3,500 years ago, or you know, 3,200 years ago, whichever date you pick, that it was a very different climate. You know, the the uh, Sahara, the Sinai. Syrian desert, the deserts of Saudi Arabia were not nearly as dry or as extensive then. There was more um, more vegetation. It was, you know, it's getting drier and drier and drier. And so it was a very different climate. But it still was desert, but it was not nearly as inhospitable nor as dry as what we know uh, now. So yes, there, there are differences. But we actually don't know a lot about that. Other questions? Emily. Okay. So it's about 
Okay, did you all hear that? No, the idea no, that, that no. the exploration, the uh, explosion, excuse me, of Thera, Santorini, happened much earlier, and there was a lot of in the, uh, the 18, 1800s or 18th century, uh, 1800s BC, and that there was a lot of record of it as having happened in Egypt, and so that doesn't seem to line up with the dates. I know that there are some people who believe that Amos was the was the pharaoh, and that for, that's one of the reasons, was the pharaoh of the Exodus. But again, that puts it 300 years earlier still, or almost 400 years earlier, and so uh, there was a National Geographic special which proposed that he was the you know, the pharaoh of the Exodus. I don't think so. I think you have too many other holes in that. So, but again, lots of interesting theories. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, the pictures they have, the divers took of the chariot wheels at the bottom of the jungle aquifer. Right. They said it was invented by a certain pharaoh, and then they changed their mind and made it more close to 1400. Okay. So, he said that the, the some of the photographs they took of what appeared to be chariot wheels, Underneath the Gulf of Aqaba, that they uh, identified it as one pharaoh, and then later on changed their their idea. And the reason for that is because the way that the wheels, there were times in the in the history when the wheels had four spokes. There were times when they had six spokes, and so the way that the wheels are made give us some idea. In fact, one thing I've read is that the the wheels that they have found. Are, su are supposed to have found under the water. Some of them are four spoke, some of them are six spoke, and there was only one period in time when both of those were used. There is one, and I've seen the photographs, but again, I can't, I can't swear to this. There is one time, uh, one set of photographs they took a wheel that they believe may have been coated in electrum. You remember the, the silver and gold um, that they, they used, and because of that, it doesn't corrode, and it, and it doesn't have any, you know, there's no calcification on it, there's no, um, coral that will set on it, and it appeared to be a perfect wheel. There has been more than a few people now who claim this, and so they're very, they're very possibly maybe something to it. You know, we'll see. Any other questions? Yes? The phrase there where it says, and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself, what right. is it? That, that's an expression that simply means miraculously. You know, that it's like I picked you up and carried you to safety. Uh, as though you were being flown there, okay? Any other questions? It's fascinating stuff. And again, whether you come from a faith perspective or not, this is half of the planet belong to the religious faiths that claim that this is a major event in, and uh, others, you know, the other sort of religious groups will say that yes, they believe it happened, whether that's part of their own faith tradition or not. So it's fascinating stuff. I think we now are supposed to be having a question and answer time, is that right? Emily, you wanna come up? Oh, yes, please do. Come on up. <coughs> so I had to give her time for a rebuttal. I, I think that's extremely well done, and it was a great reminder for me of a bunch of elements of this story. Um, as you said correctly, there's zero evidence archaeological of any of this stuff happening in Egypt, but there are a few issues. For example, I think it's Second Kings, but I'm not so great on the Bible. Uh, where it says the Israelites were forced to build the mud bricks without straw, and they were building the city of Pithom. And Pithom is clearly per Ramses, which is Ramses II. So that's much considerably later than thought most of the thirds. So what do you do about that? <laughs> we, have, we have a number of instances in the Hebrew Bible where um, a thing called prolapsus occurs, which oh. means, <laughs> when, yeah, the two cities, Pithom and Ramses, were supposedly the cities that the Israelites built as slaves. And so that's why, um, and there's only two pharaohs that, that were in place long enough that they could be the pharaohs of the Exodus. One is Tutmos III, and the other is Ramses II, or Ramses the Great, who you saw a lot of in the Temple of Luxor. But um, in fact, in Genesis, when the Israelites first came there, they, and we, we traditionally know it as being the land of Goshen. Well, originally that was called the land of Ramses in the first versions of the Bible, because Prolapsus is um, that later on in history, when names change, then when they refer to them, even if they're referring to a time earlier in history, they'll use the name that people recognize, which is a more modern name. For instance, you know, St. Petersburg. When people today, if they're trying to communicate to an audience, they won't call it Leningrad. They may say, well, you know, that used to be called Leningrad, but they'll refer to it by the name that originally had and that it has more recently, which is St. Petersburg. Similarly, um, scholars, scholars on one side of the discussion, believe that the reason why the names of Pithom and Ramses, the two sort of treasury towns, or, or um, the, the towns the Israelites were involved in, 
that the names were changed later because in the records because the names got changed in the country. And that in fact, if, if we think that Ramses refers to Ramses II, the Ramses the Great, then it doesn't make sense that they, let, they settled in a land hundreds of years before that that was also known as the land of Ramses unless the name got changed. But it was a city of Ramses. Then. Well, no, but the, the, the region, the land of Goshen, was at one point called the land of Ramses in the records. And so the idea is they used you know, they, they started using a name that was only created later, but so that people would understand what they were talking about. So from the Egyptological perspective, um, sort of what we often say, well, first of all, there are other issues also. For example, we have a lot of Hebrews in Egypt in the year 1000 BC, 900, 800 BC, and then huge colonies of Jews in Egypt in the fifth century BC. So obviously they didn't all leave. And also, the biblical accounts of the of the numbers are way too high. That's basically most of the population of Egypt leaving. And I agree is, with that. Which is a little, little problem there. But as you said, numbers are fungible, often symbolic. Um, because Egyptologists want to sort of find a meeting place on this whole issue, one possible meeting ground is uh, the suggestion that there was an exodus, but it was a very gradual migration of people related to the creation of a Hebrew identity. Because very often the, the identity, a national identity, is crystallized around some large event, which may be historical, it may have a germ of historical truth, which then is canonized into something much larger than perhaps historically it was. So it is very possible that there was a migration of Jews, perhaps a, mig a gradual migration, which would then account for the reason that it is not recorded in the Egyptian records. Because if it's not a zillion people leaving, why would the Egyptians care? So if it's a gradual migration, it doesn't show up in the records. So that's the way we try to square this, because otherwise it's you know it's it's A and B, and we don't really know where to go with it. Um, there's something else I was going to say. I just realized we have another one. Um, yeah, and as I as I said, the idea of 603,550 people, just that's the men, 20 and older, it's problematic when you think about that number of people. The just population simply, in Egypt is about two and a half million. Yeah, exactly. So it was, you know, that would have been equal almost to the pop with women and children, almost equal to the population of the whole country. And in biblical numbers, often, you know, jump to the New Testament for a second because this example comes into my mind when Jesus was asked how often we should forgive our people who do ill to us. He said 70 times 7. He did not mean 490 times. Um, he meant a lot. You know, don't, don't, there's no limit to, to how many times you should forgive. The same thing is true both in the Hebrew Bible and the Christian New Testament, that numbers are used as, um, they'll, they'll say a thousand or a thousand thousand um, in order to say a lot. You know, and it, in Scripture says, you know, to God, one day is as 10,000 years and 10,000 years a day. It doesn't mean literally 10,000 years. And so we have to be very careful about that. One scholar has done a fairly extensive study of numbers in the Hebrew Bible, and he has said that whenever, like 480, you know, we say 480, um, in German, the order of numbers uh, is different, like uh, 22 is 22 in German. They put the 2 before the 20. The same thing is true in the Hebrew Bible. There are places where they would say 480, and there are places where in Hebrew it says 80 and 400. And one scholar claims that whenever it says the larger number first, like 480, then those are numbers that are supposed to be generalized. But when they want them to be specifically interpreted, they say 80 and 400. In this case, even though our English translation says 480, the Hebrew actually does say there were 80 and 400 years between the, the start of the building of the temple and the exodus from Egypt. And so, at least one scholar, and a number of people have agreed with him on this, not everybody, there's nobody. One of the problems is that we all need more humility about this, because we, we don't really know for sure. And there are differences of opinions that we can respect. Um, but again, one scholar has said, because the numbers presented as 80 and 400 years, they really didn't mean 480 years. And some of the explanations that have been attempted, like, well, this means 12 generations of 40 years. Well, 40 is never used as a generational number anywhere else in the Hebrew Bible, and there were more than 12 generations involved. There were 17 or 18 generations, depending on how you count it. And so, whenever people strain that hard to try to come up with explanations for it, we know there's probably, a, you know, 
we need to back up a little bit. <laughs> it's um, on this trip, um, when we were in Luxor, I was talking to a number of people, and people were saying, oh my god, these connections between these different cultures are so interesting. And the ancient Egyptian and the Christian and different different groups. Oh, to give you an idea with this whole Moses story, Mose, Moses is an Egyptian name, like Ramos or Ramses. It's the short version of Ramses, so it's an Egyptian name. But um, a very important uh, part of mythology in ancient Egypt is, is Isis, who gives birth to the god uh, Horus, and Horus is being stalked by his uncle who killed his, who killed his father Osiris. So Isis is hiding her son from this vengeful god Seth. She hides him in the marshes, in the marshes of Tennis, just like in the biblical story, Moses is hid, hidden in the bull rushes. So I mean, there's some really interesting parallels. Right, and um, Moses, there have been, and you, you may have heard this, um, there have been some efforts to say that Moses is actually Hebrew and it means to be drawn out of, so to be drawn out of the water. I don't think so. It is an Egyptian name. Tut Moses, that we just talked about, means the son uh, of Tut. Uh, uh, it means it Thoth, or Thoth, or Thoth, the, the yes. one born by Thoth. Uh, yeah. Born of, or the son of, sometimes. And so the idea of Moses, when, when, when Pharaoh's daughter finds him, again, according to the tradition, and brings him in, she says, you know, you'll be my son, and I'll call you son, Moses. <laughs> sort of a pun. The Egyptians love puns. Um, so the idea is that Moses is almost certainly an Egyptian name. It means to be born of or to be the son. And so that's why we think you know, that is an Egyptian name. If you've heard people say, what's well, a Hebrew name? I don't think so. They're straining. Questions? Bob? References to famine. We've got lots of references to famine in ancient Egypt, right about the time they're building all the big, big, uh, the big temples in Luxor, there is a big period of inflation, and there is a, a, a period of famine where they're having difficulty feeding the people. But it was some, um, and that happened every once in a while when they mismanaged the economy. So there are famines, but nothing. The biggest one where you see a famine is about 2500 BC, supposedly, where you see actually scenes of Egyptians with all their ribs showing, and you can imagine how different, how weird that is, because of course they don't show people being thin or, or ill. But that seems to be something having to do with the uh, low Nile levels, or it's symbolic of something else. But there were periodic famines, but not a famine, right. and according of course, to the Egyptian records. And of course the Joseph, the Joseph story is that because Joseph was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. The seven years of plenty, they gathered up the grains and they stored them uh, by Joseph's instructions and with him being in charge of it, again, the biblical story, so that when they got to the seven years of famine that was experienced all over this region, the Egyptians were in good shape, which is why Jacob and his sons, the whole tribe of the Israelites, went to Egypt is in order to get grain because that was the only place that had them. So. And that's where you get the tradition of the pyramids being Joseph's granaries. One of my favorite things I've got in the I know and, that. yeah I've, I've got a collection of Egypto trash of you know ads and junk you know using Egyptian stuff. But one of my favorite is an ad for for a self storage place, and it's got pictures of the pyramids and it says ancient self storage. Nice. And you have to think about it to get the joke that it's Joseph's granaries. Oh, Another yes. Okay. There, one of the things too, and it's important to know that there is a long tradition, many, many examples in, in the Hebrew Bible uh, and the New Testament as well, of uh, people going back and forth between Egypt and Israel. It's almost every time there was a problem, you run off to Egypt. I mean, we have Abraham going to Egypt, where he lied about Sarah not being his saying she wasn't his wife. Um, you have uh, in the New Testament when. Uh, Herod is out to kill the baby Jesus. You have Mary and Joseph and Jesus going to Egypt, and that was supposed to be in fulfillment of prophecy. So there was a lot of traffic back and forth, and Egypt tended to be the place that people would go for refuge, according to the, both both uh, Christ, the uh, Jewish and Christian traditions. Other questions? Yes.
Well, the, it, it varies. Um, again, we talked about Tutmos the third, the one that I'm suggesting might have been the, the, the pharaoh of the Exodus. Tutmos was in charge of the armies even when he was co-regent underneath uh, Hatshepsut, Hats and so he actually was responsible for extending the borders of Egypt further than they had ever been before. So they had more territory to work with. The suggestion is that the Israelites settled in the land of Goshen, which was a very a very rich area, more toward the north of the country, you know, closer up toward the Nile Delta. And the reason for that is because the Egyptians, and correct me if I'm wrong here, the Egyptians were not real keen on taking care of their own animals, and they loved having somebody else to do it, while the Israelites were herders. And so they took over the job, you know, Moses himself was taking care of, of sheep when he was over in Midian. So the idea is they were in an area that they were able to pasture animals and care for the animals, uh, and, and that's much more in the north, which would have been the lower, lower Egypt. Is that consistent with your understanding? We got lots of examples of Egyptian herders. Okay. Yeah, it's not according to our records. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. Okay. See how much we, you know, we have to learn. Well, uh, the, the, the trick is, I mean, the difficult thing, of course, is there's so much we don't know, and it's just like with so many other things, you've got these points of information, and you could connect them in different ways. And each way seems legitimate, and each way leads to a completely different story. And so that's that's where it's, it's really very difficult. Which connecting the dots is the accurate one? And until we have more data, something very definitive, it's very tough to say anything more definitive than, uh, a, from our perspective, Egyptology. This is mainly a matter of faith. Right. Well, as I said earlier, there's two sources for our understanding of what happened in ancient times. There are the ancient written documents, which are very limited. In fact, the Hebrew Bible is second only to some of the Hindu writings, the Upanishads and some of the other ancient Hindu writings. Other than that, the Hebrew Bible is the most ancient, um, consistent like writings. It's not history as we understand it, but in terms of telling a story of the growth of a people. Uh, and so it is a very ancient document. And my inclination is to say, unless we have very specific evidence very specific evidence to counter that, then I believe we have to take it, you know, prima facie on the face of it. Now, so written documents are one version, but you also have archaeological evidence. Now, by comparison, archaeological evidence is quite new. I mean, the 19th century, 20th century is where archaeology really, really began, you know, 19th century began to come into its own, and 20th century. And so part of the challenge is you have these two very different sources of information. The written documents, which as I said earlier, are very limited in terms of who it is they talk about, and then the archaeological evidence, which often will give us much more information about common people and you know the because of the excavations of homes and we find pottery and all of that. Well, the challenge of trying to take these two very different sources and say how do these line up is an enormous challenge. And it's it's very much dependent upon the interpreters. You know, whether the interpreters take a uh, you know for the biblical interpreters, for instance, take a more traditional view or a more modern view. The archaeologists, do they, you know, do they pay more um, credence to what writ limited written records we have, or do they, you know, not really pay attention to that? It's a wide, wide range as we try to make a, make an effort to to make those two different sources consistent. How about if we open it up to other questions? Are there other questions that um, you can just Right. So, uh, just off of Istanbul, where it was the Bosphorus Strait, mm -hmm. it's it's um, they say that it was an enclosed area, just uh, uh, the, a bay, just right. like uh, the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. At one point, uh, there was an earthquake. It broke the uh, ridge line and flooded the area, which is now known as the Black Sea. Okay. And then there's the uh, Ark of uh, that was. Supposedly, an ark was found somewhere in the Turkish area, which would be Noah's ark. Now, that oh, not around any kind of years ago, and the interpretation of that after the fact, all of a sudden, can be you know brought up in various different ways by various different people. Right, but but how do we know about those naturalistic events? You know, he's talking about the idea that was the Black Sea sealed at one point, etc. 
We only know about it because there may be some writings that tell us no, about actually, the situation. No, actually, no, there's a lot of archaeology for that because the corings around the Black Sea, it's very clear that the, uh, that the level of the Black Sea was much lower originally and then it went up because there are actually uh, archaeological remains of habitation underwater. Right, well that and, was going to be my point, is that yeah. the, uh, and, it's either fact, written or it's archaeological, it's and, still... And it's thought, again, myths and stuff, that maybe that is the um, origins of uh, the uh, Argonauts and the Golden Fleece, right. was that whole thing. But, so, there is increasingly archaeological investigation of, of stuff, so that's, that's hopefully where we're going to get more data that can help us interpret many of these legendary or um, traditional interpretations. Right, and you get things like the legend of Atlantis, and there was a, the thought that that might have been Thera, or you know, areas that were then inundated because of the volcanic explosion of Thera. But yeah, the point I was going to make is that it's we either have something written about it that we read, or we have archaeological evidence. There's still really only two sources for us to understand the past, um, and archaeological evidence takes into account naturalistic phenomena as well. Because only by digging down do we find out, you know, things that things that were natural phenomena as well. Any other questions? Yes. Just one more. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how everything revolves around Helen identifying this is where this happened, this right. is where that happened, with basically, I mean, you're, you're talking about set thousands of years later in some cases, hundreds of years later in others. Is there is there any? Uh, do you have any reason to suggest this? Right. The question was, Helen was responsible, or Helena, the, oh, the saint, the, the mother of Constantine. She was the one that says, this is the burning bush, this is Mount Sinai, this is where Jesus was born, this is where Jesus was crucified. Well, do we have any other evidence for that? The, the simple answer is no. I mean, she... Yeah, she, that's kind of a problem. Yeah, it is. I mean, she came there, <laughs> now she, it, she's the best we've got. You know, she was there much closer to it than anybody else. And so she, there were some miracles that were proclaimed at that time, but um, she was closer to the testimonies. I mean, you know, she was, she, if Jesus died somewhere around 30, you know, 27 to 30 um, AD, she was there 300 years after that. But she's closer to being able to hear what the traditions were from the local people than we are. And so I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm the one who's saying she says she found the true cross, she says she found the nails of Jesus was crucified with, etc. We have no other record other than the biblical record about these events, but in terms of where these exact things happen, if you go to Jerusalem now, there are two different locations of the crucifixion outside the walls of the old city. Um, one of them, the one she identified, one that's had, there's a different tradition supporting it. But yeah, we don't know. Um, we, our old uh, pastor, who is a scholar, he's written a number of books, uh, he speaks on cruise ships. Um, he used to say, whenever you hear a story like that, a tradition, a legend, we can't just discount it. He's, and his reaction is always like, well, one wonders. <laughs> you know? Exactly. We, we can't discount it, but we also don't just swallow it whole. We, we, and as I've said to Emily, and I think I've said before, if we have specific evidence that, that comes up about, about specific things, we need to pay attention to that. You know, I am not one who says, you know, this is faith and you have to accept it. Um, I believe that God gave us a brain for a reason and we have to use it. And so I'm very, you know, I think we have a responsibility to be disciplined about those sort of things. But we simply don't have more data about that. Sign up. Anything else? Thank you all very Thank much. We will pick you up again tomorrow.